In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pascha continues in the feast of the third Sunday of Pascha, or the Sunday of the Myrrh Bears, has arrived, and we heard the gospel, the story of the time after the crucifixion until the resurrection, which is the most interesting and amazing time for the church, a time when the doors were shut and the apostles were afraid. They were afraid of the powers of this world, not knowing that they had God who was all powerful. They had not understood. Many were afraid, but Joseph was made bold, even though he was, for much of the time of the three years of our Lord's ministry, he was afraid as well. But now he makes bold. And this boldness is so important for us, so important for the powers of the world, seek always to deny the resurrection, deny our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection, and snuff out the worship of the Trinity. We always have to have this boldness as a great example. There are two kinds of boldness. There's the boldness, which is, if it is before God, condemned, or it is not right to stand with boldness before our Lord, but with humility and with fear of God. But there is a boldness when it is pious, when it is filled with reverence, which is most blessed by our Lord. This is the kind of boldness we all need in these days when the serpent has raised his head against the church and they've made bold all the enemies of God and of the truth and they're seeking to take advantage of the situation with lies and half lies to introduce a whole new way of living which will be contrary to the way of life of the church. If they could, they would snuff out the worship of the Trinity. And so this boldness is a great, great encouragement for us. He makes bold. He goes into the powers of the world, stands in front of them and confesses he is the disciple of Christ. And he says, give me the body of my Lord. And of course, the Lord and his mystery does not fit into the narrow confines of logic. And as we'll see with the Burberry women, if one is in those confines, they will not be a disciple of Christ. And so Pilate is amazed that he's already dead. But our Lord is the one who determines everything, including the time of our death. And there is no logic to worldly logic, rationalistic way of understanding the providence of God. And when he allows us to suffer or when he allows us to die, it is in his great mercy and love for us that everything takes place. He allows these things and works everything for good. And so Joseph gets the okay from the powers of the world to take the body and to bury it. And he takes it, he buys a linen cloth. This is right before the beginning of the Sabbath. He makes time and buys the linen cloth and he takes it down he wraps it with great reverence and love and who is there are the 12 apostles there no the women are there the women are observing where the sepulcher was because they're already preparing to come on the third day after the passing of the sabbath to anoint him already and after the sabbath passes it is now evening of saturday Immediately they go and buy what they need for the next morning, and that is the aromatic spices to anoint the Lord as is custom of the Jews. So they are intent, they're waiting. You can imagine with me, they're sitting all day with great agony and prayer, waiting for the time that they might be able to go and buy the spices, and then waiting again with prayer and agony. They might go early, as it says here, just 
in the early morning, very early morning, and the sun is just breaking and they're going and they're saying among themselves, who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre for us? And this is very interesting because they set out and if one is filled with the fear of the powers of the world, then they would not set out. They set out without fear that they might go to the Lord, but they had no way to open the door, that is, to roll away this massive stone, for it was exceedingly great, the scriptures tell us. And yet they set out nonetheless. And what does this teach us? It teaches that if we are, again, led by our rationalism, a rationalism, a a logic of this world of thinking, well, I am a woman and I cannot, and we at three women or four or five women cannot, oh, cannot do this. So what's the point? Why not just stay home? There's no point in going. If there's no one there that will help us, who is on our side? They're all against us and the soldiers are against us and the leaders of the people are against us. But that's not how they're thinking. They're not thinking with their head. They're thinking with their heart. Their heart is filled with love, and they cannot but go and trust in the Lord that he will uh, assist them. And, of course, the the, uh, roll, the uh, stone had been rolled away, and they became witnesses of the resurrection. If they had allowed themselves to be confined with the rational intellect alone and led by that alone... They would never be witnesses, the first witnesses of the resurrection. Uh, the, the fear, you see, that, that grips mankind, along with the rationalism, which thinks that everything that is within that sphere is all there is, these two things cripple men and make them weak and powerless and, 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 and faithless. These two things are our enemies. The fears that is brought about by the devil and his servants and the powers of this world and the rationalism which wants to have everything fit into this narrow logic of man and his puny little brain. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't entertain it. The poor atheists are in such a state, a pitiful, pitiful state. God forbid that we have the name of Christ would succumb to this pathetic way of living and working and thinking. But now is the time for us to rise and run to our Lord without fear and be with him and behold his resurrection. Where are we? Why are we all cowering in the upper room for fear of sickness, for fear of the governments of the world. The Mermaid women are an example. Their courage. They had andrikotita, as we say in Greek, which is manliness. They had more manliness than the men who were cowering in the upper room for fear of the powers of this world. But this is pre-Pentecost. We will see what will happen with the apostles post-Pentecost, after the resurrection and the ascension, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit will become lions, and they will preach to the same powers directly, and they will fear nothing, and they will say, it's better for us to obey God than men. These apostles are our teachers. These women were the, already living in that fearlessness. They already have foretaste of the coming of the Holy Spirit, and they ran ahead. They ran ahead of the apostles in this. And so they go and they see, and they are amazed at seeing this angel sitting on the right hand, clothed in a white robe. And they were amazed. Cease being amazed, he says, to be amazed. For this is the new state of things. This is post-resurrection. Things have changed. Our Lord is risen. He is not here. The place where they laid him, behold. It is no longer as it was. Everything has changed. Death is overcome. The tombs are empty. 
Now go and do the work of an apostle. Now the angels are sending the women to the apostles. They have become apostles to the apostles. That's what it means to be apostle, to be sent. And now they're sent by the angels to the apostles to preach the resurrection. How wonderful and glorious is the providence of God. And to Peter it says, it says, go to his disciples and to Peter. And here we have to stop and say something which is very instructive for us, especially those who are coming from the heresy that is um, in the West, uh, that, that believes uh, and accepts the Filioque way and accepts a infallibility. And here, this is often shown very mistakenly by the apologists of the papacy, that here Peter is singled out because he is special. He is above the other 12, 10, 11, and he is special. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. The scriptures are clear here. That go to the disciples, he says, and to Peter. He is singled out because he, was, he, he had denied our Lord. And he had to be restored by our Lord after our Lord's resurrection. And so he is singled out precisely because he is in this, in this state of yet, yet to be restored to being one of the apostles. And of course, he becomes one of the chief of the apostles along with Paul. And this is the great example of repentance, true repentance, that he returns. That's what it means to be repentant. Not to have remorse, not to feel bad for your sins, not to weep for your sins only, but to return. And he does return. But here, in this scriptural passage, He's singled out, not because he's ipso facto, always de facto the first. Quite the contrary. In the Orthodox Church, those who give the example, those who are have the experience of the resurrection, those who are confessing the faith are our examples. No matter the, the place in the church, whether it be bishops or priests or monks, our examples are those who confess, whether they be the last Christian, the most obscure Christian, they are examples. During the communist period, who were the ones that were confessing most? Those obscure Christians in the catacombs or the women who were going and keeping the churches open. So the confession of Peter is taken up again after the resurrection, and this is this what makes him a great apostle. His denial was his trusting in his own powers. Again, within the confines of the logic and the human alone instead of the divine human. And so let's not be deluded in thinking that there is some automatic power that is given to people in the church. Everything comes through the grace of God. It's a gift to those who struggle, those who love, those who confess. This is the authority in the church in every age. And he says, tell them, go, he goes, rather, he goes before you into Galilee, and there you shall see him even as he told you. The Lord is leading the apostles into Galilee, into the preaching unto the nations. This is a fore, foretaste or a, um, a sign that the apostles will now go and now preach to the whole of the world, not just to the Jews. And he goes before them. And they went out, they fled, the women fled from the sepulchre, trembling and ecstasy held them fast. And to no one did they say anything, for they were afraid, they were in great awe. And of course, who would not be in the face of this total change in reality and this future of humanity now is totally different. And the resurrection has changed everything. And we also, Need to stand with trembling and fear of God before the resurrection, not before the powers of this world, not before the passing and fleeting authority, which is for the most part in every age at the service of the cosmocratoros, the ruler of this world. But we are at the service of the pantocrator, the ruler of all things, and we do not fear. We have fear of God, but we do not fear death, nor of the powers of this world. God help us to be imitators of the holy murmuring women, and to confess and to fear not. Amen.